Coming up with pro wrestling gimmicks must be pretty difficult. I mean, when things got tough, the WWF looked at common everyday jobs for inspiration, such as a garbage man, a dentist, the tax man, nothing was off limits, and still to this day, we're seeing some quite quirky pro wrestling gimmicks that make you scratch your head in disbelief. Everything's been done before though, and being original today means creating something truly, truly unique, whether it turns out good or it turns out bad. Gimmicks can also be recycled. The general idea behind a wrestling character can be reused and given to multiple people, which, by the way, isn't a bad thing. You may have clicked on this video today expecting a scathing rundown of unoriginality, but no. Giving folks the same gimmick, or at least the same general characteristics, isn't a bad thing at all if the wrestler adds their own unique twist to it. Take for example Hulk Hogan and Lex Luger. Both guys portrayed the American hero gimmick at one point in their careers, yet both are so unique and so individual that you kinda forget that they were both essentially playing the same role. So today we're gonna look at recycled gimmick ideas and recycled character traits and we'll see how the guys portraying these gimmicks made them distinctive in their own way. How many kings have there been in pro wrestling? Seriously, it's beyond ridiculous. Most people would say that Jerry Lawler is the one and only king, yet many, many superstars have claimed right to the throne, especially after winning the King of the Ring tournament. Some wrestlers take the name of king and they base their whole character around the gimmick. A great example here would be King Booker, who became so royal and so regal that his accent changed and even the way he wrestled got altered. When Owen Hart won the King of the Ring tournament, he used his title as a way to take jabs at Brother Brett. The Hitman won the King of the Ring in 93, but Owen won the tournament in 94 in an effort to prove he could do whatever his big brother could do. And this in turn would lead to Owen calling himself the King of Hearts, the true greatest heart brother of the whole WWF. Let's not forget about Macho King. Randy Savage took the crown from Hacksaw Jim Duggan in 89 when the crown had a little lineage beyond the annual tournament. And the whole Macho King character became a pretty significant part of Randy's career, going on to last a few years before his loss to the Ultimate Warrior at Mania 7. As you can see, the general outline of the character is that of a king, but all kings aren't created equal. Every guy mentioned added their own twist to the gimmick, and keep in mind too, I'm only scratching the surface here. There's been many, many kings in professional wrestling. To be called a giant in pro wrestling doesn't mean that you're just big. No, it means that you're really, really big. We all probably think of Andre the Giant when we think of big men in pro wrestling, but there's been many other guys who came after Andre who also towered above their opponents. In WCW, Paul White was initially billed as Andre's son, and while this wasn't true, you could see why WCW made this rather ridiculous claim. Omas is another guy who stands head and shoulders above his opponents and a guy who kinda gets by on his sheer size alone. So yeah, as long as there's abnormally tall guys and girls in the world, then there's always gonna be giants and pro wrestling. For many, Andre will always be the original, the biggest and baddest of them all, and many would say even the biggest man in modern wrestling could never fill Andre's big boots. Typically, a ladies man in pro wrestling is always a heel and this characteristic has yielded fantastic results for those who can pull it off right. Ravishing Rick Rude instantly springs to mind here. He would call the men in the arena sweaty grease hogs while telling the women to pay attention while he took off his robe. And all this would happen even before he started to wrestle his match. Rick Rude wanted to make male fans jealous of his body and looks while making female fans swoon at the mere sight of the ravishing one. It made for a guy that you love to hate, and when you mix in Rick's abilities as a pro wrestler, it was pretty much the perfect combination. Another ladies man we had in pro wrestling was the model Rick Martel, and Martel differed greatly from Rude because the model was more about style, unmatched confidence, and being a pretty smooth operator. Ravishing Rick Rude was a little more aggressive, while the model was a bit more laid back, and dare I say, he showed a little more arrogance. Again, I could go on and on here and name more names, but the ladies man's always a great gimmick to fall back on if you have the looks and the promo ability to pull it off. Many more have tried to capture the attention of female wrestling fans while making us commoners look like complete losers. It's been done so many times that it's almost became a meme. The guys in charge of the company being evil and making people's lives a living hell. 
The thing is, it only really works when it's an evil authority figure and not a babyface one. There's no fun in watching a good guy make the right calls, and there's no conflict when a babyface uses his powers of good to easily crush the villains. So having a bad guy call the shots actually creates a real struggle where the odds are always stacked against the good guys. Mr. McMahon was the WWF's biggest villain during a time when the company saw record growth in terms of viewership, attendance and merchandise sales, so it's no wonder that the formula has been used over and over again. Although never forget that Eric Bischoff joined the NWO way before Vince McMahon became a heel. We've had Triple H and Stephanie as the authority, making life difficult for everyone, all leading to a great moment when Daniel Bryan overcame the odds at WrestleMania 30. We've had Eric Bischoff as Raw's evil general manager who, at one point, bounced off his babyface co-GM Stone Cold Steve Austin to great results. Vince Russo and the powers that be got a ton of heat as authority figures and Russo still carries some of that heat to this very day. So yeah, it keeps coming back because it works so well. <laughs> yeah, it's super specific I know, but that's because so many tag teams tried to take what made the Road Warriors so special, and the results are pretty much all over the place. At one point in time, Hawk and Animal were so popular that many wrestling organizations tried to recreate the Road Warriors tag team by giving guys face paint, elaborate entrance gear, a hard ass attitude, heavy rock entrance music. Everyone wanted a piece of the Road Warriors success, and it got to the point of being… it was a bit embarrassing. Demo Demolition would be the first team that springs to mind and thankfully over time Demolition were able to separate themselves from the Road Warriors and find success on their own merits, but others who shamelessly ripped off Hawk and Animal include the Powers of Pain, the Blade Runners, the Ascension and the Master Blasters. At one point it was comical for wrestling companies to wheel out evil Russians over and over again, but there's been many, many anti-American gimmicks that have worked incredibly well over the years, and that's thanks to additional layers being added to a fairly standard character trait. Take for example Muhammad Hassan, Hassan felt he was treated unfairly as an American citizen because others viewed him as a threat following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This was a bold and pretty ballsy idea for a pro wrestling character and one that could have went in many different directions, but it got cancelled really because it went too far. There's also the Hart Foundation, a group that claimed they weren't necessarily anti-American but very pro-Canadian, a group that was fueled by Bret Hart's resentment towards American fans and their treatment towards him in comparison to the likes of Shawn Michaels and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And then we had the Bulgarian brute Rusev, claiming to be a super athlete who didn't initially speak English, but instead spoke volumes by the destruction he would cause inside the ring. Evil foreigners are seen as a pro wrestling trope, a reoccurring theme that reeks of predictability. But this really doesn't have to be the case if writers give the characters in question unique motivations and reasons behind their disdain. Unhinged pro wrestlers, wrestlers so wild and so unpredictable that their whole character gets based around how unstable they are. There's so many different levels to this, there's the feral George the Animal Steel who was so unpredictable each and every time he stepped in the ring, there was Brian Pillman whose loose cannon gimmick became extremely fascinating thanks to how he jumped from company to company while caring very little about what he did or what he said, John Moxley's another unstable pro wrestler who turns to ultra violence as a form of pleasure and release, and you've also got someone like Psycho Sid who was basically one card short of a full deck yet his unhinged nature allowed him to be an unstoppable force inside a wrestling ring. It's not enough to be told you're going to be a lunatic for the rest of your career and expect to get by with just that instruction. You can't just act like a madman and expect to create intrigue. A good psychopath has an underlying motive or reason for the things they do and that's where the intrigue comes in. That's why it worked so well for Brian Pillman, in my opinion. If you're not a bona fide giant in pro wrestling but you're still a big guy, chances are you're going to get lumbered with the classic monster heel roll, a big unstoppable force that's going to cause a lot of issues for company babyfaces. Yokozuna was very successful in this role while also getting some of that evil foreigner stuff thrown in for good measure, Earthquake 2 caused a lot of problems for Hulk Hogan as did King Kong Bundy, the man they call Vader was big, strong, extremely scary but also gifted in terms of his athleticism. 
And speaking of athletic monster heels, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention Brock Lesnar here. Although as I record this video, Mr. Lesnar isn't being seen in the best light possible. Mark Henry's Hall of Pain run was all about the world's strongest man focusing on being nothing but an ass kicking monster against each and every wrestler who dared step in the ring with him. Abyss and TNA literally used the monster as his nickname. The Samoan bulldozer Umaga was one of the scariest dudes to step into the ring thanks to how he intimidated his opponents in an almost primal way. Yeah, we've had many monster heels in pro wrestling and you'll notice the most successful also incorporated other traits to make themselves stand out. For some reason, the WWF or WWE have fallen back on money men or financially successful men as a villainous character archetype and I think this speaks more about Vince McMahon than anything else. Whether it's an aristocratic snob like Hunter Hearst Helmsley or the lavish million dollar man Ted DiBiase, it seems like a successful man makes for an easy villain in WWE because, well, we don't like people who flaunt how better off they are in comparison to common folk. JBL's an interesting character study here. Bradshaw's real life success as a stock market investor created this new elite businessman role for John Layfield on WWE TV. And while many of us would be happy to see someone doing well for themselves through smart business investments, the WWE decided that this would make for a perfect villain. JBL pretty much became J.R. Ewing from Dallas, a rich man who wouldn't think twice about sinking pretty low to get what he wanted, all while taking an immense amount of pleasure in making everyone else's life a living hell. Alberto Del Rio also fell into the more aristocratic side of things with his luxurious cars and his own little butler or manservant. Ric Flair used to flaunt his wealth at every given opportunity, talking about his custom suits, his gator shoes, his expensive robes and how he lived a limousine riding, jet flying lifestyle. So again, it's not about just creating a character who has an extraordinary amount of wealth, it's about adding layers and making each of these men different from each other through their backstory and their motivations for getting in the ring. It's weird that there's been so many musicians and dancers in wrestling, but they do say music's the universal language that everyone speaks. Wrestling in itself can be described as performance art much like music itself, so when you think about it that way, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Musicians usually come in the form of guitar players such as the Honky Tonk Man, Elias and Double J Jeff Jarrett, but let's not forget about other musical instruments that made their way into a wrestling ring, like Xavier Woods' trombones. When it comes to dancers, god there's been so many. The disco dancing fool known as the Disco Inferno, ballroom dancer Fandango who would correct people when they said his name wrong, we had three count who could sing and dance just like your favourite boy bands of that time period, and of course there's the incomparable Alex Wright who had a thing for commercial Eurodance music. There's loads more I could name here, Flash Funk, Brodus Clay, Too Cool, Rockabilly, Van Hammer, The West Texas Rednecks, Jillian Hall, PN News, wrestling and music just seem to go hand in hand but in saying that, these kind of gimmicks do seem to be exclusive for the mid card tier. Many say the greatest pro wrestling character of all time is The Undertaker, and when you think about it, it's actually insane that The Undertaker remained so popular for so long. Nothing is believable about The Undertaker. He claims to be the reaper of souls who can either make his opponents rest in peace or damn them to an eternity in purgatory, all while shooting lightning bolts from the sky, ascending to other levels of existence and even rising from the dead after being buried alive. In a way, it's so ridiculous that it actually becomes comical, yet fans have respected and adored the Undertaker character for decades because it's just so incredibly cool. Undertaker isn't the only guy who utilizes supernatural forces in pro wrestling though. His brother Kane may have been a bit more psychologically damaged, but he too once had some extraordinary abilities that us mere mortals could only dream of. I mean, the guy could shoot fireballs at one point in his career. Many would write off Papa Shango as nothing more than a mere voodoo practitioner but when his curses actually began to work then you know something unworldly was going on. But then we can dig right to the bottom of the shit heap and look at something like the ECW zombie, the WWE's representation of the living dead that really clashed with what pro wrestling fans expected from a show titled Extreme Championship Wrestling. There's always going to be supernatural forces at play when we watch pro wrestling, it's one of those things we just accept because, well, why not? It's harmless, it's silly, and sometimes it can create true legends of professional wrestling. 
Sometimes no gimmicks needed, but this also creates a category in itself. If you come from an athletic background and if you find success in other forms of legitimate combat sports, chances are your whole pro wrestling persona will be based on your past achievements. Ken Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man, had a successful MMA career before he stepped foot in a WWF ring. The commentators wouldn't let fans forget that Shamrock had a fighting background and this background did go a long way in making Ken feel more legit, especially for those unaware of his MMA pedigree. Kurt Angle, Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, Chad Gable, all these guys had credentials in the amateur field that extended as far as the NCAA championships and even the Olympics. These kind of achievements really shouldn't go unnoticed and the WWE in particular like to remind fans that they've got some bona fide real athletes on their roster who could legitimately kick your ass if they wanted to. Now, in saying that, these kind of credentials can only take a wrestler so far. Kurt Angle became so successful because he mixed in some brilliant character work along with his in-ring abilities. Brock Lesnar blended in monster heel traits along with his unmatched athleticism. Chad Gable recently found more success when adding comedy to his usual routine. And you'd like to think Shelton Benjamin could have been a whole lot more if he or the WWE figured out a few more layers he could have added to his character. Benjamin was still excellent, but his earliest success got lumbered with him also being an underdog. Either way, coming into any wrestling company with a pre-established combat sports background is always a good thing, and one that seemingly gives a head start in comparison to your contemporaries. Being a heel rebel is easy, being a babyface rebel takes a lot of time. You see, all good pro wrestling babyface rebels were heels at one point or another. They knew what it was like to fight the good guys, but then the rebels in question get this insane amount of unexpected crowd support, and this creates a perfect opportunity to have the wrestler in question fight the good fight while still having some badass heel tendencies. The perfect example would be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin was cheered as a bad guy and when he turned babyface he flat out told everyone that he wasn't going to change for anybody. Austin would then fight against McMahon and his evil corporation all because Steve refused to fall in line and be the champion that Vince wanted him to be and this whole storyline created one of the greatest rebels in pro wrestling history. Roddy Piper is another great example. Much like Stone Cold Steve Austin, Piper refused to act like a typical babyface when it would have been very easy for the hot rod to do so. Instead, Piper walked his own path in the WWF which differed greatly from that of a typical babyface. And even when he arrived to Atlanta in 1996, Piper refused to swear allegiance to World Championship Wrestling while fighting the NWO. You can't really talk about Rebels either without talking about CM Punk. Punk got so tired of the WWE machine that he promised to take away the WWE Championship before leaving the company for good. Punk began this journey of defiance as a typical pro wrestling heel, but when the title match arrived at Money in the Bank 2011, fans really wanted to see Punk win just to see the WWE thrown into complete disarray. Punk spoke from the heart during his promos, something that many fans thought was refreshing and new, and by going against the grain and speaking honestly about an industry built on deceit, fans gravitated towards him. Never had someone been so open about how they felt about working for the WWE and this rebellious side of CM Punk became the talk of the internet for a very long time. Again, it's hard to pull this kind of thing off and it's hard to script these kind of things. It takes the right moment and the right circumstances to make a good pro wrestling rebel. The vast majority of people think that being a comedy wrestler is a bad thing, and when you point out some successful comedy wrestlers, people are quick to point out that those guys aren't comedy wrestlers because they're too good. No, 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 a comedy wrestler is just that, a pro wrestler that provides comic relief. Their main purpose is to entertain you by giving you some laughs while also showing how good they are inside the ropes. There's nothing at all bad about being labelled a comedy wrestler, and as a matter of fact, the job role's probably a lot harder than what we give them credit for. The Hurricane was a fantastic comedy wrestler. Not only could he go in the ring, but he ensured to keep his superhero mannerisms on display at all times. His entrance, his in-ring taunts, his promos. Shane Helms did a wonderful job of making The Hurricane a highlight of WWE's weekly TV, and he should be applauded for getting so many years out of a superhero gimmick. Santino Morella's escapades were great too, another wrestler who stayed true to his gimmick and you just never knew what you were going to get out of this guy. His promos were goofy, his little power walk entrance always got a laugh, and inside the ring he didn't care about making himself look foolish if it meant people in the audience were smiling. 
Toru Yano's comedy goes beyond spoken dialogue, you get the jokes through his actions alone. Danhausen's character is so unique and entertaining that he was able to build a cult following long before getting national exposure. I've seen stand up comedians with their own TV specials who have way worse comedic timing than our truth. Really, we should be celebrating these guys instead of looking at comedy wrestlers like they're lower than other performers who grace our TV screens every week. Long live comedy wrestlers. Pro wrestling isn't just about who's the strongest and who's the fastest, it's also about who's the smartest. Being ring smart would mean watching a ton of old tapes and studying your opponent's every move so you're ready and prepared for the upcoming match. But some pro wrestlers go beyond this and some wrestlers want to show that their brains are just as big as their muscles. We have had many, many smart individuals grace the wrestling ring and most of them have been bad guys. I mean, no one likes a smart ass, so it kinda makes sense. And usually fans are gonna find joy when these brainiacs of pro wrestling get outsmarted by their dumb opponents. The genius portrayed by Lanny Poffo played this role perfectly. He would wear his academic hat and his gown to the ring, he would read poetry that mocked his opponents all while making himself feel superior, and for a while the genius did draw a good amount of hate from fans all while remaining very entertaining. Christopher Nowinski was a Harvard graduate who felt his Ivy League education meant he was better than everyone else. Chris's heel role in the WWE was quite typical but the man's true achievements in wrestling and sports in general is the real extensive research and work he's completed in regards to head injuries and CTE. It's through Nowinski's work that Moore's now understood about concussions and head trauma in the world of sports and Chris's achievements don't get celebrated at all because WWE obviously don't want to bring attention to the fact that so many wrestlers have suffered from these catastrophic head injuries. Finally, one of my favourites, Damien Sandow, the intellectual saviour of the unwashed masses. It took weeks for this new gimmick to debut because Damien felt the commoners attending wrestling shows wouldn't learn anything from his matches and he also felt his opponents weren't good enough for him. Over time, this gimmick was given more comedy layers and it turned out to be highly entertaining and it worked so well because Damien went all in. You could tell he was having fun with it and it's a shame that the WWE kinda squandered it. Like much of the stuff I upload, I always feel like I'm just scratching the surface and there's so much more I want to talk about or I could talk about. It's why I kinda prefer putting out a series of uploads on a given subject rather than these one-off type of deals but use the comment section to talk about more gimmick archetypes, stereotypes and recurrent themes. I've left a lot out including generational wrestlers, underdogs, microphone masters, mystery men. There's more to look into here and maybe I'll revisit this topic again in the future using your feedback from the comment section. So please let me hear from you, like the video, subscribe, all that stuff, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you very much for watching guys and please take care.